And we're live now. We're happy you're joining us today. Welcome. I'm Peter Caldas, CEO of the American Society on Aging. Uh, tune in tomorrow at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern for our annual public policy town hall session. It's a live interactive discussion with ASA members on where our country stands today, where we might be heading, and what our role as AS members should be. Jay Newton Small will moderate a panel of national policy experts, including issues you decide are the most pressing and relevant to ASA's policy <clears throat> agenda. But now for the main event. Welcome to the four pillars of the new retirement, Dramatic Changes for Aging and Aging Services, which is sponsored by Edward Jones and is part of our ongoing virtual AIA 20 series. And now I'd like to welcome today's presenters. Dr. Ken Dykwald is one of North America's foremost visionaries and original thinkers regarding the lifestyle, marketing, healthcare, and workforce implications of the age wave. Ken is a psychologist, gerontologist, documentary filmmaker, former ASA board member, and founding CEO of Age Wave and best-selling author of 17 books on aging-related issues, including his brand new book, What Retirees Want, a holistic view of life's third age. Ken is donating all of his earnings from this book to ASA. Ken, thank you very much and welcome. Ken Sella, Ken Sella leads the client strategies group at Edward Jones, the investment services firm with nearly 14,000 locations, 7 million clients, and $1.3 trillion in assets under management and focuses solely on individual investors and small business owners. Ken is a member of Edward Jones's executive and management committees and is the senior executive sponsor for the firm's Inclusion Council and the Hispanic Business Business Resource Group, in addition to service as a director on the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association Board and a member of the Private Client Group Steering Committee. Ken Sella, welcome to today's webinar, and thank you so much from ASA for supporting our work. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here with you. Well, and now, welcome, without everyone. further ado, Ken, you can take it away. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. It's, um, it's humbling to see such a, an audience, but uh, not surprising knowing that uh, one of your own, Ken Dykwalt, is here with you today. Um, and I just want to start by uh, just addressing head on. So you might be wondering, why did an organization like Edward Jones um, commission a study such as the four pillars of the new retirement? Um, it, it really comes down to one thing. We wanted to better understand people. We wanted to better understand how they could live well in retirement. And we know that retirement is being redefined. Uh, my guess is that um, some of you are experiencing that at whatever life stage that you're at, whether you're in retirement or planning for retirement. Uh, it's, it's a whole different ball game today. Uh, we see that every day with our clients. Uh, we see that in the communities that we serve all across North America. Uh, our business model is, is far reaching. <clears throat> And uh, as we thought about this question of how do we help people um, better live uh, the kind of life they want to and just understand that more deeply, uh, we, we just thought, well, who better to partner with than AgeWave? Uh, so we, we began on this journey together. And as we have, we've really discovered some, some really compelling things and we're excited to share it with you today. Uh, I, I think for me, one of the things that was so moving out of this work is people are looking at retirement differently. They're seeing it as a whole new chapter, uh, a chapter that's not just about the things that our my grandparents would have thought about in, in retirement, but a chapter filled with purpose, a chapter filled with possibility, and a chapter filled with, um, as you're gonna see in, in, in just moments here, uh, lots of questions that they need uh, help uh, guiding uh, through and, and, and getting to the right answers for themselves. In fact, we're so compelled by what we've learned. Um, we just want to democratize this information. Certainly, we're going to share it with our clients and, and our financial advisors to help guide their clients. Uh, but we're excited to share it in venues like this one here today. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ken Dykwald, who uh, I know is going to get us started off here in the study and, and help you understand some of the intellectual property and the research uh, that went into this. Thanks, Ken. It's good to see you. Hope your Good family you. well. By the way, I hope uh, we got lots of people, several thousand people signed up for this session, which is quite amazing. And 
from everything from the legal field to Israeli uh, Council on Gerontology to one of my dear mentors, Deborah Zeke, the founder of the modern wellness movement. Deborah is currently 98. And uh, so it, when we were looking at the list of signups, it, it was kind of humbling and we're so appreciative. So what I'm going to do is we're just going to jump right in. Uh, I'm going to hopefully this will work. If not, we have our handy AV mastermind also happens to be the CEO of ASA. Can everybody see that? Somebody's tell me if that's up OK. We good? I hope, well, I need to know if that's coming through. Somebody needs to send me some kind of a heads up. Well, I'm gonna get started. Um, <clears throat> so, as some of you know, for the last 25 years or so, we've been doing studies in the United States and all around the world, we being age wave, to try to understand what people's hopes and fears and worries are and dreams even and, and, and what terrorizes them about growing older or aging or retirement. And I had reached a point in my own career where I was thinking, you know, I'd like to do sort of a capstone study, something that would represent kind of the best, the fullest, the most holistic view of this we'd ever done. And we had heard all these wonderful things about the Edward Jones company that it's not the Wall Street firm, it's the Main Street firm. They're the people that care about folks in their families and their communities. And we got into discussions and then we joined in with the wonderful people at the Harris Poll Organization and even brought Humphrey Taylor at 85 years old uh, to join the rest of his team to kind of help us with this. And we dreamed up a study that we thought would be comprehensive and holistic. And partly what would make it interesting and different is the fact that we'd be focusing not just on money or not just on housing or not just on leisure, but on the four pillars, which rose up as being the most important to folks, health, family, purpose, and finances. Just a little bit of background. Uh, we reviewed about 100 other studies that a lot of other wonderful firms and not-for-profits have done. We had subject matter experts in the United States and Canada. We did online forums and also in-person focus groups. We spent thousands of hours with experts in teams trying to figure out what questions do we ask, and then we got a little bit uh, carried away with ourselves and we thought, let's do a 9,000 person, five generation representative study, all walks of life, representative of the populations in America and Canada by ethnicity and gender and economics. So it wasn't just a rich person study or a city person study. And, uh, and then we got set to launch it and then COVID happened. And we all got on the phone and we said, wow, what's going on here? Is this just some sort of little week or two delay or? And as the weeks unfolded, we realized, no, we are into something serious and different. And we at AgeWave and Harris turned to the Edward Jones folks and said, you know, if we do a study, I'm not sure we're gonna come up with anything that's, that's gonna mean anything going forward because everybody's in such a chaotic and frightened and different state of mind. And to their credit, and I'm saying this not just to, you know, be a happy uh, partner, but it was a momentous moment, it was like, when a lot of other people were kind of saying, well, this is not a time to really probe, Edward Jones said to us, if there was ever a time to really understand what's in people's hearts and minds, it's now. Because we're seeing so much on the news and in the media, we don't really know. So we rewrote the whole study. We spent months being able to craft questions that could probe, what do you say now? What would you have said back January? And, um, you know, you can't get everything done in a study, but you can go for quite a lot. So first, um, what I'm going to do here with you today is I'm going to go through some of the insights from health and family and purpose, and then I'm going to hand it off to Ken, and he's going to share with you some of the insights from the finances zone. I do want to say one thing. For those of you that do newsmaker studies or studies that are meant to be in the public domain, and, and all the work we do at AgeWave, we don't keep it secret. We want everybody to have access to whatever we're learning. Um, you hope to get media impressions, meaning someone's going to read it in an article or, or see it on the news or hear it on the radio. And a lot of people say, boy, if you can get 25 or 50 million media impressions, you're doing pretty well. Well, as of this morning, we, the study's been out about six weeks. We just passed a billion, 400 million media impressions. 
So partly what's happened is we have really hit a nerve and issues regarding aging and the generations and what we arrived at and what we saw happening in this study are now being picked up and talked about and discussed not only in the United States and Canada, but frankly, all over the world. So let me jump in. First, let me set the stage. These first few points, a lot of you folks are you know, deeply familiar with. Um, you know, we're in a time where average life expectation has been elevating due to health breakthroughs in the 20th century. And so more and more people are now contemplating, you know, who am I going to be when I'm 65? <clears throat> how am I going to live? Am I going to have enough money? Uh, how will society deal with me in my later years? If you look at this over a 100,000 year period, it's really quite a profound story because medical anthropologists now tell us that throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectation of birth was under 18. By the way, I would like to point out that there's a lot of discussion about our constitutional signing. And when that was done a couple of centuries ago, the life expectancy in America was only 37 and the median age was 16. So this idea of becoming a more of an aging society, an aging world is new and relatively unanticipated, and there's a lot of room for solving problems. If you look at the different demographic segments in America, this is a plotting of how they're gonna grow or shrink between 2010 and 2030. And I have to tell you that for anybody who thought, oh, that aging issue, that's, you know, that's kind of a marginal stuff. We'll get to that some other time, uh-uh. America is growing older. It's where the most growth is in our population, and it's where some of the most challenge, biggest challenges and opportunities will be. Uh, Ken mentioned this. One of the first questions we asked is, how do you define retirement? And thinking that people would say, well, it's a time to rest. It's a continuation of what it's always been, or maybe it's the beginning of the end. Uh-uh, it's not what people said. And by the way, not for this call, but when you download the report, we can disaggregate this by gender, by race, by ethnicity, by city, by rural. But overwhelmingly, people in America said this is a whole new chapter in life. By the way, I will tell you that when my I turned 70 during COVID, when my grandparents turned 70, they were dazzled that they had lived that long and were not dreaming of their next chapter or a new career or you know, what are they gonna to do to reinvent themselves? Today, that's what's on people's mind. And in our focus groups, when we talk to people about aging and retirement, the word freedom came up a lot, but it had two forks in the road. One was the freedom from, you know, I don't have to go to work anymore so much, or I don't have to raise my kids, although some are doing that now for grandkids. And I know in my case, for example, I'm no longer caregiving my parents because they are no longer alive. And people also said freedom too. You know, if I'd like to volunteer, I got the time for that now, or I wanna play with the grandkids, or, or I just wanna sleep in and watch my favorite TV shows. There's more freedom in this stage of life than anyone has ever encountered. A word of concern, that not everybody is having a grand old time in their later years. The study showed that about 16% of the US po and Canadian population, but I'll stay with the US, say that they're having a rough time, that it's they're either doing poor or just fair. That's a lot of people, that's almost 10 million people, and it's likely that number is going to grow. And so those people need particular kind of respect and regard, but it's not to say that everybody reports that they're doing having a rough time in their later years. In fact, a huge number of people say they're doing really well. A couple of uh, slivers of some of the COVID effect, and I'll, we'll get to more as we go. 68 million Americans say it's altered their retirement timing. Wow. Um, talk about a disruption. Uh, but it splits out. Most people who say that it's changed their timing say that they're gonna retire later on average, about three and a half years. People are saying if they're able to continue working, the hit to their savings or their uncertainty about how much money they're gonna need, or now they're helping to support their kids, they're gonna work longer. But some people said, you know what? This COVID thing has taught me there's more important things than working. I want time with my family. I'm gonna retire now. That's only one third though of those who think they're gonna work longer. This next slide, and I'll help you interpret it, was really interesting. Man, oh man, did this get all, all of our group and our teams talking. Look at the yellow bars on the bottom. 
we asked people from each generation, how would you characterize how you're coping with COVID-19 and the whole circumstance in our country? And if you look at the Gen Zers, wow, there's a lot of people said they're not coping well, 24%. Silent generation, only 5%, boomers only 12%. You look at the top of the bar, who says they're coping very well? Twice the percentage of older people relative to younger people. And boy, did that get us thinking because that was so counterintuitive because I think especially those of us in the aging field, we think that people who are older are having a, a rough ride of life. Well, compared to younger people, a lot of older people feel that they've got some perspective They've been through hard times. They feel appreciative of the life they live. They've also got some safety nets. You know, there's a huge amount of home ownership among people over 65. It's over 70%, 60% of which is paid off. We often don't think about. And the average payoff for an individual for Social Security last year was $18,000. Per couple, it was $31,000. And the market value of Medicare policy is around $11,000, $12,000 a year. Now, I'm not saying that that's enough, but those are safety nets that seem to be working during COVID. Most younger people, a 30-year-old just lost their job, got no medical benefits. 45-year-olds having to homeschool their kids, how are they gonna get their work done at the same time? How are they gonna pay their bills? Interesting insight, the media really took off on that. And then one of the questions that we asked was, have you suffered mental health declines? Look at this that older people say that generally speaking, they're doing okay, they're holding steady. They, and especially those who are, have some social connection or are pretty good at a digital connectivity or who got family who look after them or care about them. Younger people on the other hand, feel that they're getting the wind knocked out of them. You know, what happened to my life? What happened to going to college? What happened to my job? What happened to the gig economy? Knocking them out. Let me go through three of these pillars a little bit. First, health. We decided to cut and carve this in ways a little different than some of our studies or maybe even some of your studies have been in the past. So first we asked people, how would you rate your, who would rate their physical health as either good or excellent? And you can see if you look from left to right, that the younger the generation, the more excellent people feel their health is and that scales down. But look at mental health. So we've often said, boy, there must be an upside to aging. I know there's folks on from the Milken Institute right now and Paul Irving's great book, Upside of Aging. But one of the upsides of aging might be greater mental fortitude. Resilience was a word that kept arriving during our discussions, that older men and women have got a resilience in the face of challenge that perhaps no one else has. We also said, well, what about big towns, small towns? Turns out that the highest level of mental health going on in America right now among older adults is in small towns, cities, densely populated areas, more of a struggle. Now, this next point uh, really got our attention and I think is worthy of far more discussion than we can get to today. Let me talk about health span versus lifespan. So let me explain this chart here. Look at the United States and Canada, just to make it easy. We are very proud of the fact we've got an almost 79 year average life expectancy. But Canada, our neighbors to North that spends far less on their healthcare system, lives, the people there live about four years longer than we do. That's a huge difference. But even more important than that, we spend a large chunk of our later years in a state of ill health. So we have not created a healthcare system that effectively matches our health span to our lifespan. And so in this country, people are averaging 10 years of ill health, far more than any other where any other of these countries that we've got featured here. By the way, I, I throw these next two slides in, we're not gonna be able to unpack them, but we also map down the life expectancy by state, the darker the color, the lower life expectancy in America. And it's a big spread and also healthy life expectancy by state, the darker the color, the lower. 93% of retirees say it's never too late to improve your health. 
Doesn't matter if you have abilities or fewer abilities or if you've had health challenges, it's never too late. However, when we asked about what are you most frightened about regarding your health, and the folks at the Harris Poll said, well, you don't want to ask this question because everybody's going to say COVID. What's new there? Number one no, health concern, concern among older people, among older people. is Alzheimer's. I'm getting an echo here now. I don't know if somebody can give me some. I'm just going to keep going. Number one fear is not COVID or cancer or stroke. It's Alzheimer's and related dementias. People do not want to lose their minds. Interestingly, if you segment it among the African-American population, greater fear for COVID than for Alzheimer's even though Alzheimer's disproportionately affects people of color. But there's an intention action gap. Even though more and more we know that there are things we can do to keep our health for more of our life, only about half of our retirees say they maintain a healthy diet and only about half say they exercise regularly. Here's another thing. The people at Pew came out with this information that right before COVID and then in the middle of COVID, the telehealth and the digital technology usage among older adults was quite low. And before COVID, okay, that's kind of funny. Grandma doesn't know how to do a Zoom call or grandpa doesn't know what TikTok is. But during COVID, we saw that digital incompetence or this digital divide can be lethal. And so all of our aging programs around America need to also have components and considerations of teaching people how to be digitally competent. Let's take a look at family. This was interesting to many of us because a lot of us who are older grew up and if you think of family, you think of, you know, mom, dad, brother, sister, you know, cousin, relatives, blood relatives. It's not what people are thinking anymore. People are saying, you know, that family of biology, that's what used to be. Now it's families of affinity. And this is largely being driven by the younger generations. So among old and young, not only are there different, perhaps, interest in music or fashion, but there's a different definition of what it is to have a tribe or a family and community. And I would also say that those who are older we might do well to pay more attention to younger people because what matters to them and what they are craving and needing during this time of COVID and in their lives, community, respect, regard, some safety nets really popped up in this study. 67% of Americans say the pandemic brought their family closer together. So almost like uh, go to your room and take a time out and think about what matters People told us in the study that the scariness, that the separation forced by this, the quarantining, the sheltering, has caused them to call their kids more often, to tell their brother or sister they love them, to, to, to try to be there for your community and your family more even than ever before. I've been now in focus groups all over America, or our team has been in them, and it's really eerie. It doesn't matter if you're in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, or San Diego, or Harlem. You ask people, what are your biggest fears about aging? And you'll hear the same phrase, I don't want to be a burden on my family. And what we realized was, is that there's all this generational generosity. Our elders don't want to turn their backs on their kids. They won't turn their backs on their brothers or sisters or moms or dads or the next door neighbor. But interestingly, they don't want to be a burden on their family. But during COVID, 24 million Americans stepped up to become the family bank and support their adult children. And some of you may have seen from Pew last week that right now, under the age of 35, 52% of all Americans are living with their parents and grandparents or, and or grandparents. It's the highest percentage ever. Even during the depression, it only went up to 48%. We asked people a sensitive question and it told us a lot about our nature as Americans. You know, this, this focus on we're blue states, red states, you're this, I'm that. We didn't see that so much. What we saw was a huge amount of regard and love and respect for people's families and communities 
and appreciation for the lives they've been living. We asked, are you willing to offer financial support to your family, even if it could jeopardize your financial future? 71% said yes. So learning to create boundaries, learning during these difficult times for people how to best care for and support each other without damaging their own futures becomes a topic of conversation, whether it's with one's social worker, one's financial advisor, or just Thanksgiving dinner. There's a two-way street going on. A lot of young people, because they're living with their parents or grandparents now, are saying, hey, mom, it doesn't seem like you know how to do telemedicine. Let me teach you. You know, when I was growing up, my dad taught me how to ride a bike and then drive a car. Never occurred to me that I had an obligation to teach him things. And I tried to, but what we're seeing is that perhaps we need to open the pathways for not just some, but younger people to help older people be able to function in this new digital world. Then we ask people about leaving a legacy in terms of this family context. And what they told us, elders, the most important thing they want to pass to their families and loved ones is not about money or property. It's about their values, their stories, their life lessons. And then we ask their heir, the younger people, what about you? Um, that must be not the way you're thinking about it. Well, yes, it is even more so. And so have we set up community legacy exchange programs? Do we sit down with our recorders with our 60 and 80 and 90 year olds and say, tell me the lessons that are most important to you so that your children or their children will be able to have them for life? I'm going to tell one personal anecdote here, then keep charging along. In the fall, I was asked to, uh, to give a, a keynote at a conference and the other speaker was Harrison Ford. This was pre-COVID. And I'd never met Harrison Ford, and he gave a great speech about saving the environment, and he said we need to get all the young people planting trees, and everybody cheered. And I had a private meeting with him afterward, and after I fawned over, you know, nice to meet Han Solo and all of that, I said to him, you know, Harrison, we got 68 million retirees in this country. Nobody's asked them to plant trees as a unit, as a group. And we got a billion retirees around the world. Nobody's tasked them with anything. And think about the meta message of having elders plant trees in whose shade they never sit. So what we see crying, people crying out for here is help us share it through the generations. Help us pass it along. 30 million Americans had end of life discussions for the first time during COVID and they weren't necessarily morbid. It was, let me tell you how I want my medical directive to be respected. Let me tell you how I want my loved ones to be cared for. Let me tell you what I'm frightened about. And I know that on this call, we've got people from many faiths and leaders in a variety of religious uh, parts of our world. And I would say that people are yearning for sort of deeper discussions about end of life, which glides me into purpose uh, as another theme. And was purpose was a subject that wonderful folks like Mark Friedman, and such have talked about, and AERP is doing some neat work on this track, but it hasn't really been probed in a study and even put on par. We ask people, what is your greatest source of purpose? It wasn't about material stuff. You can see what the chart says here, and you'll be able to read it in more detail afterward, but it's being with people they loved and being loved back is where Americans derive their greatest purpose. And then we said, well, how does that fractionate based on financial resources? If you're modestly resourced or wealthy, the same. But about a third of the retired population say, you know, I'm not sure who I am anymore. I'm trying to find a new purpose. Who do I talk to about that? Is there a purpose school I can go to? You know, I can't afford something really expensive, but... I'd like to know how to shed the life I've been living and emerge as a newer version of me at this new stage of life that more and more is involving the desire to give back. A red flag here. Currently, only 24% of our retired population have volunteered. This is pre-COVID. Three quarters 
don't volunteer at all. Last year, the average American a retiree watched 48 hours of television a week. And even those who do volunteer average two and a half hours a week. So that means that today's retirees are spending about 2,800 and some minutes a week watching TV, and on average, about a half an hour a week volunteering. Maybe that's a message from this study. And when we asked people, 89% of the entire population of all ages say, wow, we really need to have our elders contribute their knowledge and talents for the benefit of their community, our communities, and society at large. We also saw that today's older adults, while they appreciate being cared for by professionals in the aging field, they also want to be teachers. 95% of retirees say, in addition to being teachers and mentors, they want to be students. You know, one of my buddies, uh, Chip Conley, who wrote the book Wisdom at Work last year, and conceived of this word mentor. You know, the idea of, I, I can teach you, but maybe you teach me too. And rather than seeing me as the needy one and you as the giver, why don't we set up relationships and community dynamics where we're helping each other with what we've got to share? Well, I'm gonna, in a second, um, turn this over to Ken Sella, but one thing I, I, two things I wanna say before I do so, that what was swirling in my head when I was not only reviewing the about a thousand pages of data and reports and tables was, wow, there's a whole lot of focus in America on thinking people want to be useful. And I kept thinking, I think people really want to be useful. And even though it's hard to see inside or outside our own ageist prejudices, and I'm I was reminded in this of my dear friend and mentor Bob Butler, who in 1968 coined the clinically, you know, it's a, it's a clinical diagnosis of gerontophobia, the idea of discomfort with old people, discomfort with one's own aging. And I think that somehow what's emerging is that while older people, some may struggle, and some may struggle really with great difficulties, and we've surely got to put more attention and more regard and more resources towards that. There's also an untapped resource there. And holding the image of older men and women as only needy versus able to give and wanting to give, maybe that's a time where that model is shifting. Because I've watched now hundreds and hundreds of articles and media discussions occur based on this study, and I've read them all. And a lot of what people are discussing is, gee, I hadn't really thought about my mom that way or that elder man who lives in the apartment across the hall from me, I never really asked him to help me with this or that, or does he want to learn how to use computer? So this idea of intergenerational interdependence crossed my mind quite a lot. Let me hand this over to my friend, Ken Sella, uh, and Ken will walk us through some of the insights we got from the finances section, and then I'll rejoin when we come to the end of that, and we'll field some questions. How you doing, Ken? Hope you're there. Hi, Doing well, thank you, Ken. Great job. And uh, you know, I, on, on one level, you might think, well, we just covered the first three pillars, which are more of the emotive pillars, the things that we, you know, naturally are geared toward as human beings. Uh, it turns out the finance pillar is pretty compelling itself, uh, and we didn't expect that. Um, and, and so, what we've learned is that in retirement, money really provides two things for people. And you see it on the screen here: freedom from things that they worry about. Uh, so now it is a new chapter for them. And then freedom to, I'll just say, live their best life um, and, and to live the way that they want to. So that was really surprising for us. We dug deeper and uh, we asked the retirees, what gives you financial peace of mind? And you can see the data here. They want to live comfortably until the end of their life. Um, you know, most people are concerned about their, their spouse or their partner and making sure that they're taken care of. Uh, they want to know that they have enough uh, to save for the unexpected because that's coming up. And debt was a, a concern for people as well. So my guess is uh, those are not big surprises. Uh, we, many of us share these, these concerns from a financial perspective. So then we asked older adults uh, about their greatest worry. And, and really, uh, once again, these were relatively expected results. Turns out people are really concerned about health care costs. It's actually one of the biggest financial challenges in retirement today. 
and that includes long-term care. Um, we all know that unexpected sp expenses are, are oftentimes a shock. Uh, and, and for someone who's doing a good job helping um, an individual understand their financial goals, you know, that's where a financial advisor can really come into play, is, is planning for that unexpected. So then we got into some facts. 68% um, of retirees, say they have no idea what their health care and long-term care costs will be in retirement. So that was, that was a surprisingly high number. Um, so I would guess that that means that many of you watching today are wondering that very same thing. Um, so this slide uh, is, is really some facts that we were able to pull together around the idea that uh, out-of-pocket expenses for health care and long-term care are going to be close to a half a million dollars in retirement. So no wonder it's uh, such a concern for people. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a big chunk of money for anyone. Turns out three quarters of working Americans are not on track with their retirement plans prior to COVID-19. Um, and, and that one was also, um, while not really surprising, uh, something that we weren't exactly expecting. Uh, we, we felt like, you know, on track uh, was, was, had some subjectivity to it. So we, we had to dig a little bit deeper. Um, 20 million Americans then reported that not only did they not have enough, but they stopped making retirement contributions during the pandemic. So uh, once again, reconfirmed what Ken talked about earlier, that, that phone call huddle that we had when COVID-19 became a reality and whether or not we continue this study. Um, I think this is evidence uh, that we not only did the right thing by continuing the study, but now it's the intervention that we put in place. Uh, to help people see the importance of saving at all times. Among pre-retirees, the impact of COVID-19 has further driven down confidence. I think that's not a big surprise, uh, particularly given the previous facts. And 56% of retirees wish they had budgeted or planned more for the unexpected. We saw that just a little bit earlier. Now, one finding that I will say was most surprising from the financial pillar was more than one third of retirees say that managing money in retirement is far more confusing than saving money for retirement. So they're both complex scenarios and they're both stories that financial advisors can help with, uh, but people are finding it harder to work through everything that they need. And so that really led us to, to dig deeper. Um, and we asked people what they what they need, what they what kind of help they need. And it turns out people want a financial advisor to really do uh, one primary thing, and that is act as their financial guide. The, the data was overwhelming here. Of course, being an investment advisor certainly is something that many people expect, but it's really that role uh, that a financial advisor plays as a, as a guide to to help them navigate through the difficult decisions retirement brings. Um, and, and people want help on a variety of different topics. Uh, and they want it from someone who understands their financial goals. That came out in the study. Uh, and someone who could really help them navigate all the challenges, their investment strategy, their drawdown strategy, um, how, to, how to deal with taxes, long-term care expenses. And of course, uh, Medicare and, and Social Security uh, are, are big concerns. Now, we also asked people, did your financial advisor provide greater sense of comfort during the pandemic? And this was really affirming. 84% of people said yes. So it's times like these when a financial advisor can really play an important role, um, particularly when they're acting in that role as a guy. So, you know, I went through those pretty quick. Um, I, I really think that the, the, the key finding that we had in this study was sure, the financial aspect of retirement is, is of uber importance, but it's really the balance between health, family, purpose, and finances that has to come together um, in, in an overall plan to really help people feel understood, um, in control of their future, uh, and ultimately secure uh, and confident about their future. That's, that's really what it's all about. And so these four pillars, we believe, really reinforce that. Now you can probably see why we want to democratize this information and share it with just as many people as we can. Um, so Ken, I don't know if you have- uh, Yeah, Ken, uh, before, we, before we jump into questions, um, let, me, let me put you on a spot for a moment. So we've got 
a lot of people on this call who spend years, decades of their lives working with older adults, being in aging services, being in universities. Uh, here you are spending your entire life in the world of financial services. When you looked at these results, what were the biggest takeaways for you as a, as, as a human being, as a dad, as a worker, as an employer? Yeah, that's a great question, Ken. Um, you know, I, I mean, this is going to sound like I'm taking it right from one of the four pillars, but it's it's that connect, that through that through line and connection of purpose. And, and going back to what I said in the beginning, um, we we started this research because we wanted to better understand people. Um, we're all we're all human beings, and um, we wanted to understand what it took for them to live well in retirement. And um, you know, and, and I think to the to the good guidance that you've given us, Ken. You know, when we started on this study, we made the decision to really include everybody. Um, so we we included all age ranges. Uh, you, you said it earlier. Uh, we threw out the demographic chart and just said we're going to include everyone in this study because everyone thinks about retirement. So I think uh, what moved me is the expansive nature of it. Uh, how purpose was a through line uh, in, in the entire conversation that, that's been had about this. Um, I'd say what's elevated for me is the importance of relationships, um, relationships with the people that we love, but also relationships with um, the people that take care of those that we love, uh, relationships with each other. Uh, you know, I think that's come through loud and clear. Uh, there's not a there's not a technology platform that's going to help most people through these kinds of difficult decisions. Um, it's going to be a guide, someone who can really help them uh, understand them. You know, so much of um, what we do as a as an industry and as a profession, I think it's lost in the shuffle because you know people think about the stock market and the financial markets and everything else. But it's it's a lot about um, understanding people. It's a lot about asking good questions, um, caring about people's responses, and then investing and helping people accomplish their financial goals, those things that matter most to them. And uh, we saw that in these four pillars. You know, it's, I mean, what, what people care about is their health, their family, their purpose, and then how they're going to make that happen financially. I mean, I know that's true for me. So I think uh, I'm, I'm really going long here, Ken, but I think what really came through for me was just how, as people, we are um, fairly united in how we how we need to be advised um, to to live the kind of lives that we want to. So I'm I'm super excited that we did this in a holistic way. Um, you know, the four pillars really bring it home, and and I I, uh, I just love to see what people's questions are. Every time Ken and I have a chance to share this information, uh, the audience is typically geared up and ready to ask some good questions. So. Happy to do that. Yeah, so let me add a few points and then put a, a URL up and then we'll be open to questions. I think sort of what the punchline is that retirement is being transformed into a time of new freedoms, new connections, new purpose, and some real challenges, both because of the length of time people are going to spend, partly the aftermath of this coronavirus, and also the cost of funding a longer life especially in a time of so much uncertainty. Uh, let me see if this is up on the screen. You see there's one of my insistences when we did this is that everything about this report would be available to everyone, even other financial firms or people who may not have an interest in the financial side of gerontology but are wondering about their own lives. So uh, this link here will take you there. There's no fee. You can just download it. It's yours. So, Peter. Let me, uh, we can switch back over to you and see what kinds of questions you or our participants might have. Absolutely. Gentlemen, that was a very comprehensive uh, overview of a really dense and thoughtful study. So thank you very much for the time of walking through it, albeit a little quickly. Uh, but I know that lots of folks have questions and they're coming in. And while we're waiting for them to sort of queue up, um, Ken Sella, let me ask you, you know, you mentioned that um, uh, you you commissioned this study. It was before COVID. Interesting, first of all, that a company like Edward Jones would commission a study like this, tied so much to aging. 
I'm wondering why did Edward Jones do that when so many other companies sort of struggle with seeing the value of that data? Well, okay. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's a little bit of a surprise to me that other companies wouldn't see it quite as valuably. Uh, we see ourselves in the business of understanding our clients. Um, it's, it's, it's one of our core values um, is that our clients' interests come first. And so, uh, look, we, we go to work every day becoming students of, of the people we serve. And um, studies like this that can add to, you know, our ability to bring the thought leadership um, that's required for our firm to evolve the ways that we support our clients. Um, that's, that's what we're in business to do. Um, you know, uh, certainly we're a for-profit organization and we want to run a profitable business, uh, but we're a purpose-based organization. And, and so our purpose is to make a meaningful difference in the lives of our clients, uh, the lives of the people who work at Edward Jones, and quite frankly, uh, to make a meaningful difference to the communities that we serve and the ways that we give back in those communities. So, I mean, that's really probably at the core of it, Peter, is for purpose for an organization. And this is one way that we follow through on that purpose. Well, well, thank you for that. Uh, I know so many on this call uh, appreciate that kind of support. Um, speaking of which, a lot of folks on this call, Ken Deitwald, have asked a lot of questions related to the numbers and the data. You, you and I aren't surprised that so many of our ASA members are, are geeking out on the data. So could you um, answer one question that has come up thematically here? And that is around any sort of rural and urban divide that seems to come up in a number of contexts in some of our questions. Do you see any differences in some of the data that you researched? Yeah, it's a great question. We had many, many, many Zoom calls on that because we were expecting massive differences. So let me first answer in a platitudinous way. Uh, there's a lot more of a common ground and common heartbeat in our country than is being portrayed, I think, in the media. The differences, and by the way, the data is available, uh, the difference between people of different economic levels, rural, urban, racial groups, was genders even, there were differences, but they weren't like screaming differences. But let me answer your question. Um, the people in the rural areas were less jittery about COVID. Um, they were more uh, inclined to be near and able to bring their family home. Uh, I will also tell you that in Canada, uh, people in Canada were less inclined to financially subsidize their young people and then we are in America. And I'm gonna swing back to the rural urban because I, I know the heart of the question. Let me stay on that for a second. And we probed into that and brought in all sorts of Canadian experts. And they said, first of all, our government sort of jumped in during COVID and, 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 and made safety nets available. Second of all, a lot of young people don't come out of college with enormous amounts of debt. In the United States in the last 40 years, the cost of college has, multiple, has grown 1500%. So a lot of young people, in Canada are not straddled the same way. And of course, the fact that a lot of medicine is covered. By the way, most long-term care is not covered in Canada unless you wanna be in a skilled nursing facility. So Canadians were terrified of the cost of long-term care because they've never in their life really dealt much with paying for health and such. But back to the rural urban, you clearly saw in urban areas more uh, density, more people anxiety about losing their job, more concern about how am I possibly going to survive uh, if I can't pay the bills? What happens if I lose my job? And I'm going to give you one thread of that that may be not exactly the heart of the question, but it's connected, that one of the big issues during COVID has been the concern about assisted living and skilled nursing facilities. And I've been on a I'm chairing a task force with Colin Milner and also the former Surgeon General Rich Carmona. And one of the things that we noticed was a lot of the people who are loving and caring for and toileting and bathing and watching out for our elders are people in urban areas who are vulnerable themselves. And even though there's been enormous attention appropriately focused on first responders, doctors, nurses, who are doing amazing things at this moment in history, not so much attention on the home care worker. Not so much attention on getting protective gear to the assisted living aid, who may have two jobs and who may be someone who's living in an apartment with four of their own relatives. So there were certain issues of ethnicity and congestion 
and contagion that were going on in the cities, much less so in the rural areas. Let me leave it at that for now so we can make other room for other questions. Great. Um, Ken Sella, this one's for you. Uh, around, there's a lot of data that talks about how uh, a number of retirees are prepared for their futures financially, but that increasingly a younger generation isn't. And the question from the viewer here is, how do you see this impacting um, specifically housing and the ability to uh, rent or own one's home as they age when they haven't planned for it or aren't able to? Well, that sounds like the million dollar question, right? So <laughs> the number they can share earlier was quite shocking to me. Ken, what did you say? The, the percentage 72% of Americans over 65 are homeowners, 60% of which are paid off. So that means 40 to 50% of older adults in America have no rent or mortgage payments. They may have tax payments, but they have no rent. And then they're asking questions like, should I sell my house? Should I have roommates? Should I maybe rent? Should I have my grandkids move in with me? Because those homes are a meaningful asset. That's not the same as the future generations. Will they be able to afford to rent or to buy? Or are we going to become multi-generational communities again in our homes? We don't know the answers to those yet. But let me switch it back to you, Ken Sella. I'm yeah, yeah. yeah, so as we do this kind of work, uh, one of the things that we found, Peter, is that um, blanket statements are, are very difficult, right? So you, you have to really be careful about that. Um, I think sometimes there's a propensity to think about a younger person as um, less able, less responsible, less skilled. Um, and, and our findings actually show that's not the case. So, uh, you know, there, uh, one of the things that we do know, there is less of a propensity uh, for a younger person to think about the investment in a home uh, for example, in the same way that previous generations have. They just don't. They, they're more mobile. They have other priorities. They have things that they're focused on that are beyond home ownership. And so for a lot of them, it's a, it's a means to an end. Um, and, and so uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, support the notion that younger people are any less financially responsible. In fact, I think we've seen just the opposite in our research, and that is that uh, people are, are, uh, younger people are, are more purpose-driven and oftentimes more focused on their financial futures connecting with that purpose. And so it may be a different characterization of financial priorities than previous generations have had, but it's, it's not a diminution of their financial responsibility. And so uh, I think it does lead to a lot of what Ken talked about, and that is for a younger person, they're perfectly willing to live with mom and dad. They're perfectly willing to um, save those financial dollars for other goals that align with their purpose. And so I think we'll learn a lot more about that um, in, in, the, in the years ahead. Um, I, I can't help but think about a study that was done on with millennials. And, and it was a, a, a panel of, of millennials that per, sort of gave different personas of, of different millennial types. And I think the punchline of that was, do not stereotype us. You don't understand us well enough. We're a pretty different kind of a generation. So. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have a lot of specifics on exactly financially what people can do to get back into, uh, you know, the kind of rent situations that they want to and that sort of thing. But I, I, I would encourage broad uh, thinking in this. You know, I, sticking to the generation. Can I, can I speculate on something? Yeah, on yeah. Something yeah. Just, I mean, this is a speculation, so it's not – we didn't ask this in the study, but when I started working in the field of aging in the 1970s, I was in my 20s with our SAGE project, um, those elders, when we asked them, what were the formative dynamics in your life? Most of them said it was the depression. And yeah. they felt that it was so traumatizing for their parents or for them as young people that they lived their whole lives saving for a rainy day and trying to not spend what they couldn't afford. And they were frugal, which made them unappealing as consumers, but they lowered the poverty level of elderly from 35% down to about 12%. Boomers have lived in an era of affluence and prosperity and easy credit cards. And we knew, we'd known for years, that about a third of the boomers have less than $10,000 in their lifetime net assets. So here you have a whole generation that has not been saving for a rainy day across the board, that has been living for today. And 
my sense is that a lot of these young people, this will be formative for them, what's taking place in COVID. They're watching their own moms or dads be out of work, and they're saying, I'm not going to let that happen to me. Or they're saying, wow, you didn't, you didn't save enough to pay? I'm not going to find myself in that situation. So my speculation is that this will be a financially formative experience for a young generation that will carry them for decades. Let's stick to this theme of, of generational differences. Um, Ken Dykwald, I, I know you've talked about this in the past, and I know it's a focus of yours, whether it's in your book, and it came out in this study as well, but talk a little bit about how the generations can help one another here, whether it's through mental health or through taking on new caregiving burdens. Uh, can you just walk us through some of that? Again, this is now a personal opinion. This is not necessarily Edward Jones or directly data from the study. But I, uh, I have been, I've been taken, particularly during this COVID experience, of how I'm going to steal an idea from Maggie Kuhn. Uh, Maggie used to say that, um, you know, the founder of the Great Panthers, that somehow America had all carried away with the idea of independence. You know, everybody should have their own phone, their own bedroom, their own car, their own everything. And when we get older, we know that interdependence is how it works. You know, I need you, you need me, we need to help each other. And, you know, I'm reminded in terms of older people of a very futuristic, wild, leaning towards the impossible show in the 1980s, called Golden Girls. And and the idea there was you have four women who came together to share a home and one was a mom and they they helped each other. They looked after each other. They uh, made things work because it was a lot less expensive to do things interdependently than everybody being independent. I have been struck by during this period of time how younger people really need grown-ups to let them know that things are going to be okay and to give them, you know, to steady them down a little bit and give them some perspective because they may be cool, they may be hip, they may like Charlie D'Amelio on TikTok, and that's all fine, but they're scared. And historically, people have looked to their parents and grandparents who either had the answers or claimed to. And now a lot of young people are looking to grown-ups, and they're realizing they don't particularly know all the answers right now, but they, I think they could use a lot of kind of maturity and eldership from older adults. On the other hand... I think that a lot of older men and women uh, have so much perspective and so much time and maybe are, are beyond some of the critical decades of their lives. And, and now this is a time where they could be helping the next door neighbor and babysitting that grandchild or, or learning if they did technology to, to share some of their stories and their suggestions. I, um, I don't know. I'm envisioning, and partly what's happening too is I can't tell you how many Zoom calls I've been on where the person on the call says, "Well, I'm here in my living in my grandparents' house now," and "Hi, Grandma," you know that all of a sudden we're kind of in this situation where there's more commingling of the generations sometimes, and people are saying, it "Kind of feels good," you know, it "Kind of feels good." What what made us become so age segregated? And do we really need senior centers or do we need to bring back community centers when we get this COVID in the rearview mirror? And I'm not saying we should do away with senior centers, but I'm asking the question of isolation. I think that having the generations be lending a hand. I want to say something more about this, which is a little more sensitive. A lot of older people say, yeah, I'm helpful to younger people, my own children and grandchildren. And I would challenge that. I, I still think we have a need for an elder core in this country. I think if an elder has some time and skill or perspective and they can help somebody in a different community. And, you know, for example, I'm uh, there's an organization that began. It's a company called Eldera. I think the Eldera founders were actually on this call. I wasn't thinking I was going to mention it. But the idea was through Zoom for young people who might have a need to have another grown up in their life to have a Zoom meeting each week with a grown up. So I have two little girls, they're cousins, that I have an Eldera session with every Sunday. And I don't have to go anywhere. They're not my own kids or grandkids, but we become friends. And they tell me about their schoolwork, and they tell me what it's like to be stuck at home and not be able to play with their friends. And it causes me to feel more empathetic. And that's the word I want to focus on. And they ask me about my life and 
tell me about your kids. And I just think that empathy versus sympathy is what we need to have more of. Unfortunately, we could do a lot more of this in this culture. And I think that it's on us as the grownups, as the elders, to not wait for somebody else to make it better. But I think that's partly our obligation as elders during this difficult time. And a lot of young people need our help. Ken, Stella, I wondered if you could just touch a little bit again. We're getting a lot of questions on this intergenerational, uh, I guess, divide or generational divide that, that I guess the media wants to pretend that is going on. Um, talk a little bit about how financial advisors, maybe those at Edward Jones or generally speaking, are preparing for this kind of uh, one, an intergenerational workforce, but also intergenerational advice. Like it, it changes from generation to generation, right? You bet, you bet, Peter. That's something that we think about every single day. And by the way, I've got to say, I'm, I'm going to sign on to Eldera and, and learn more about this. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, great idea. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it's right in this swim lane. And, and so as we think about serving our clients, we, we talk about it this way, our clients and their families. Uh, so that's really in earnest where it starts. And, and so there is a very real intention for our financial advisors to get to know their clients. And, and, and so when, when we say that, you know, what we find is that people care about transferring, you know, what they have to their kids. But surprisingly, what they, when you really ask them what's most important, it's not the financial gifts and the financial assets that they're most concerned with. It's their values. It's the things that they care about. It's their, um, you know, it's their preferences for, you know, how, how to think about uh, the causes that have been important to them. And they hope that in some small way that that can have an influence. Um, and, you know, but I, I think it goes even beyond that to the, to the word of empathy that, that they can use, which just spot on. That's what we all need to be thinking about. People want to know mostly that, uh, that as their values pass, that they're raising someone who will do good in the world. And so there's, there's such an important role that a financial advisor plays there, oftentimes as, as a coach. Now, look, you saw that in the study, people really geared to the word as financial advisor as a guide. Coach was at the bottom of the list, okay? But despite the fact that the word doesn't resonate, I'm going to go ahead and use it here in this context because I think that's ultimately what happens is that, you know, the, the, the very real fact is many of our clients look to us to say, you know, You've done such a good job helping us. You know, since we've met you, we've been able to do these following three things that were our goals, and now we feel like we can do that. But we've got something else we need to ask you. You see, you don't know our kids as well as, as maybe we would like for you to. And, and what we'd really like to be able to do is to have you understand them. And, you know, we actually think you might be able to relate to them a little bit better than we would. And, and so, you know, here's some of what we care about. It's not important to us that they necessarily care about everything that we do, but we want to know that they're on they're on track, and that we, we want to know that they've got some kind of, somebody speaking into their life in that way. So that's that's a really powerful and important way um, that we play a role. Uh, now, now look, I think one of the things that um, that every financial firm are, uh, like ours struggles with is that you know by by virtue of the asset management uh, industry's construct, um, you know we can't help people that don't have money, it, you know so so that's sometimes part of the question, right? So how do how do you you know how does that Jones thinking about think about from a purpose perspective, uh, helping younger people or that next generation? And Peter, to that, what I would say is um, we are very much thinking about not only younger folks, but also um, people who are disadvantaged. I mean, we've had um, what I would refer to as a triple pandemic um, over the last six months, you know, health, financial, and racial. And so we're really beginning, um, and I'll admit that this is only uh, a short-lived uh, effort, and so we haven't, we haven't been after this for decades, but we now have begun work to really understand how would we serve in a different way, who, who maybe don't have, you know, the traditional asset base that, you know, that would, would come seeking out the, the help of a financial advisor. And, uh, and and there are ways to do that. You know, there are subscription models where people can pay according to their, um, to, the, to the level of service that they get. 
Um, and there's certainly uh, value that, that any financial advisor can, can provide them. So it's a great question. Thank you. Can, can I, yeah, I want to jump, being a, you know, part of the aging network for 45 years now, um, there's the world of professional financial guidance. Um, but then there's the whole idea of educating a population so that they will have more financial fortitude, if possible. And I've been struck at many ASA meetings over the 40 years that I've been coming to ASA and W. There's very few financial people there, uh, as though that's not, that shouldn't be a part of the aging network. And I know, Peter, your background, before you got in aging services, you were a lawyer and you were working in philanthropy at J.P. Morgan. And so for me, if more 20 and 30 and 40 year olds were given some of the, whether it's from Edward Jones or the community church, some guidance, on the basics of finance management and saving and the value of tax advantage and so on and compounding, then maybe some people would be better off downstream. And so I think financial matters need to be a part of the full equation. Yeah, Ken, I'm, I'm with you on that. I also think there's an opportunity for real exchange too, where our aging network providers could, you know, collaborate with financial advisors in their communities to really uh, teach folks on the resources available and the way folks actually leverage these resources to build up a savings. Uh, and I think there's opportunity for more financial advisors to engage with the aging network in that regard. And yeah, go ahead. I want to add one other thing. Um, I get this once a month after I pass 65. It's from Medicare. And on the upper, uh, upper left, it says, this is your Medicare premium bill. And on the upper right, it says, this is not a bill. Now, that's incomprehensible to me. And I've got a PhD, I've written 18 books, and I've worked in the aging field. Medicare and financial information about retirement is largely not user-friendly. The number one most popular seminar in the financial industry is what the heck is Social Security and how does it work? It's not sophisticated investment strategy. So I think the aging network, it behooves us to make sure that anything that involves money that whether a person is very modestly resourced or is well off, it, it's user friendly. It's not, got, you know, part A, part B, donut holes. I don't even know what that means. So how, how can we make sure that people as we age in this country are feel comfortable and have a sense of reliance on experts or organizations to educate and empower them? That's a personal point of view. Yeah, it's and a great question. I'm sorry, I was just going to let Ken know. Thanks for letting us know that you were in the two-thirds of the people in the study who, who really do need more help from the financial <laughs> advisor. We can help you with that, Ken. That's not a problem. Good. But, but I'm, glad you bring up, I'm glad you bring up Medicare and Social Security. You know, um, tomorrow we're having our big town hall policy um, session. And of course, ASA members, as they do, ask a lot of policy questions too. So I want, there's one theme that keeps coming up um, from our audience, and that's around Social Security and the availability of it and how one plans for the possibility that it may not be around. It's a question for both of you. Yeah, I'll take a stab uh, at, at the start. We get this question a lot, and uh, it's, it's really one of proactivity. Um, so the, the very fake fact, uh, matter of fact, is that uh, we, we have not done a good job as a country in dealing with this issue. And, and so it, it's becoming a generational issue that hasn't been solved. And so I think the cold hard facts are that um, people will increasingly have to take responsibility for their own financial futures. And, and that's exactly where, um, you know, this fourth pillar comes in, right? It, it, it's it's really about responsibility um, to start as a young person thinking about what it is that you need to do and then carrying that responsibility throughout your lifetime. You know, Ken talked about how the Great Depression has had such a profound impact on, on the greatest generation. And you can identify those, those you know, pivotal um, um, life events that have happened for, for different generations. I think uh, you know the, the the reality is the, the generation ahead um, that's it, it, about to retire is is probably in decent shape. But after that, um, you know, I think we're going to find that for the most part, you know, income from Social Security will become a far 
smaller part of the overall retirement plan. And we've already seen defined benefit plans uh, start to go to the wayside. So, you know, in a few short years, they will they will basically not be in existence. Uh, that is that is a issue that our country has to deal with. And the only way we know how to deal with that head on is to prepare people to take the most responsibility. Ken, did you want to add anything on the Social yeah, Security? I'll add, and, and, um, you know, I realize that this is a uh, beehive topic, but you asked. Um, <laughs> I was more taken this last year by how valuable those safety nets are than ever before in my career. That to see people, we talked about COVID as being a, a horrible coronavirus, novel virus, and then we talked about it impacting the economy. But partly what we went after in the study was we asked questions about how's your state of mind, you know, how's your head, how's your mental health? And those people who had some safety nets were, were better. And so I imagine, what if we took that all away and something like this happened? Not be a good place to be an older person in a, in a world like that. However, what Ken's saying is also important, which is that in an era where people only live six or seven years, you didn't have to save all that much and where a large portion of the population were getting employer paid for benefits, guaranteed benefits, Social Security, and then when you had people saving quite a lot because that was kind of how they grew up, Social Security would have would be one part of a three-legged stool, let's say. Increasingly today, with people not getting guaranteed pensions and with people not saving very much, the reliance on Social Security became, becomes even more extreme. And the question is, with the aging of the boomers and that huge demographic size, are the young generation going to feel so generous as to say, okay, double down, give them more, even though they didn't save enough? And even So for me, the way I hold it in my head is there are segments of our elder population that are far more in need than other segments. And just like in marketing or business, how do we do an even better job of shoring those people's lives up, showing them great respect and regard, while at the same time encouraging and educating people for maybe they can live together, maybe they can work a bit longer, maybe they can relocate to an area, and maybe they can re-educate and retrain themselves to be able to continue to work. So it's an ecosystem of solution. It's not simply this or that, in my view. Yeah, great perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Peter, um, I, know, I have a question for you, Peter. I know we only got a couple more minutes, but you're, you know, we've not physically met, but we've had so many meetings and phone calls. When you hear this data, what I'm putting you on the spot, what strikes you as particularly either unnerving or important? Well, you know, this year at ASA, we're focused on equity. Um, the country's having a huge uh, debate right now about how, or rather uh, an awakening of how there is so much lack of equity in so many of our basic uh, services, whether it's in public health, whether it's in aging, whether it's in the financial services sector. And I think what we're trying to do is highlight where ASA members and where we need to push to actually elevate the issue of greater equity. You know, we didn't really get into it on this call, and candidly, we're three white guys on this call talking about this sort of issue, but I think it's important that as allies, we think about these things and everything that we do. And I know Edward Jones is terrific on these issues, and Ken, you and I have talked about equity before. So for me, the study is exciting because it reveals a lot of data that we can synthesize at the ASA and deploy to demonstrate how greater equity is needed across these four pillars. Thanks. Um, can I add one little personal thing? Somebody mentioned about my Aldera. So I have these two little girls, they're cousins. I won't mention their names for privacy, but they're, they live in Brooklyn and they're just fabulous. And every week we have these calls and we have to conjure up, what are we gonna talk about? And I'm gonna read them a book or they're gonna, teach me jujitsu, which they have. And uh, about a month ago, I said, oh, we're coming to the end of spring. And I coordinate through the dad. And I said, um, so let's maybe talk about springtime. And then we can talk, me and the girls, we can talk about how it feels when the summer comes and then the fall and the winter. And I'm thinking I'm being all like grown up and baby boomer philosophical. The dad wrote me back. The girls think that's boring. They'd rather talk about racial injustice. Wow. Nine and ten years old, and I man, was that a learning so session for me? 
And I think that those of us who are older, we can't lose our curiosity and we can't just create policy based on 1980s notions of what the role of an elder is. We've got to have much more back and forth between generations and ethnicities and sexual fluidities. And that's got to be a key thing. So I'm fully behind your and I apologize. You know, I am who I am. But I think your, your focus on equity is a major theme for ASA just seems like so important. Absolutely. Thank you, Ken. Well, that is uh, one way to end this uh, this fantastic broadcast. Ken Sella with Edward Jones and Ken Dykwald of Age Wave. Thank you very, very, very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Be well. Be healthy. Be safe.